Welcome to another episode of Blighty Talks Bricks. Um, but uh, it just occurred to me last night, uh, before I introduce my uh, guest, um, that we're already starting to form a little trait here. Uh, and that trait is the quality of my, des uh, my guests. The gentleman I've got today meets the same levels that we've had before in that he is just one superhuman being. Um, I've been lucky to know him for a number of years now. And um, he's, he's one of those guys that after you spend a little bit of time in his company, you always feel more wholesome and uh, always feel happier. Um, for those of you who are watching, you'll see that I've got my um, retro uh, England cricket top on back from the early 90s. And uh, I'm not sure he would have worn a hoodie, but he certainly would have worn uh, a shirt like this. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my guest for today, uh, Mark Rampakash, MBE. Mark, welcome to Blighty Talk Bricks. Steve, good to be here. Thanks, Greg. Lovely to see you. Are you well? Yeah, all good. You look well? Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Um, we're just going to have a chat about uh, a few things today. And um, as I say, you and I have known each other for a long time. Um, one of the things I'll touch on before we talk maybe some cricket, because I remember you being pretty good at that, um, maybe before we touch on uh, Strictly Come Dancing. Um, somebody mentioned to me the other day that you was, uh, and I have actually had the, the privilege of watching you play for the Arsenal Celebrity Eleven, but um, you were a pretty good footballer. And is it true that you were on the books of Watford? Well, I, I, I run around and kicked anything that, that was in my way or in front of me, I think. Um, I was a, I, I, I developed a love of cricket in the summer when I was a kid and I developed a love of playing football as well in the winter. And, you know, that, that sort of went along from age, I don't know, 9, 10, uh, up until 15. And I was training a little bit with Watford at that time, 14, 15. And uh, the people at the club who sort of looked after us was a fellow called Tom Wally, Tommy Darling, and uh, Steve Harrison, who are, you know, they'll be well known. Absolutely. To people yeah, I remember, I remember all the names. Yeah. And, of course, Watford were doing very well, at the, you know, around that time. They had a fantastic team, certain John Barnes, Luther Blissett. Uh, some fantastic players. Um, anyway, I, I got selected for the under-15s uh, and we went over to London Colney to play Arsenal under-15s. Um, we lost 7-0 and I was playing... He wasn't goalkeeper, was I it? was playing central defence, uh, which probably meant I needed to concentrate a bit more on my batting. And that was really... Did you actually just feel after that game? It was as simple as that. You just had that moment that clicked on you, went, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because... Um, I mean, back then, you know, Arsenal had some players from sort of, uh, you know, obviously all, all over the UK, uh, you know, they had one or two Scottish and Irish player of Welsh. I mean, of course, now it's gone truly global, hasn't it? Yeah, around the age, so, but uh, even then, you know, their team were just, you know, they were different gravy. So um, I had to uh, reassess. And um, to be honest with you, I had, I, I probably had 1% more uh, passion and joy playing cricket as well oh, did so I, I did lean that way but um yeah the football was great fun you know I would say to the kids that I coach now look you know do other sports you know the, the fitness obviously the fitness element transfers um we've got a lot of uh, boys who play hockey now which you know the skills of using uh the hands, nation you know, ball ball transfers nation. to cricket the multi-directional fitness of it so you know I, I very much encourage youngsters to play you know and have a go at different sports well, I have to say, I, you know, when I, I remember going to a game at St. Margaret's Bury in Hertfordshire, uh, my son and I went to watch you play in the Arsenal Celebrity Eleven, And I remember you t cutting him from the right wing, dropping your shoulder, cutting him from the right wing and stonking this amazing shot top corner. Um, I've sent the video to Arteta because we need goal scorers at our, our favourite team, Arsenal. But what was interesting that day, it was a few hundred people that paid money to come. It was a charity thing. Um, I remember looking around and seeing a number of uh, 10, 12 blokes all looking at each other going, wow, that bloke can play. So, so you obviously was very good. And uh, I would imagine from a, from a cricketing fan's point of view, um, you made the right choice in certainly going to play uh, for England. Um, so let's, let's touch on um, the cricket situation. 52 tests, 18 one-dayers. Um, I think it'd be fair, and, and I hope... You, you don't mind this, I think it'd be fair to say that your talent was unbelievable. Um, but you was also known to be a little bit feisty if you'd nicked the odd ball and got out on a shot that you didn't think you should have got out to. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
I was very driven, you know, very ambitious. Um, you know, I had been from an early age. I just had that real competitive uh, streak in me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, as I progressed up through the age groups, you know, I'd had quite a lot of success and I got into professional cricket and, um, you know, all my eggs were in one basket. I needed to make that work. You know, I didn't really pursue education to much of a level. Um, I went, uh, I signed professional for Middlesex in 87 and I, my first full season was 89 and, um, there were quite high expectations of me and I had high expectations of myself. And so I was pretty tunnel vision, committed, driven, what are all those things? And sometimes that would boil over in the wrong way. And, um, you know, looking back now, you know, I wish I had, had found a better balance between being focused but relaxed. I think I found that in my 30s, but in my 20s, um, it certainly led me to um, some places where I didn't want to go. It, what I mean by that is, um, you know, it sometimes affected teammates. I got myself in hot water in terms of disciplinary incidents and things yeah. like that. And I don't think it was good for me as a person, you know, in terms of my mentality. I needed to be a little bit more philosophical. Sometimes in cricket, there are things that happen that are outside of your control. I mean, that probably goes for life as well. Yeah. And it's uh, recognizing that uh, and being able to sort of deal with it and rationalize it. And I think that perhaps the frustrations would, would boil up inside me and I didn't really know how to, to alleviate that. And I, as I say, I think I found that a bit better, that balance in my 30s. So if, I don't know, examples, I mean, maybe you come in, did a few cricket bats, get sort of <laughs> swung around the room or pads thrown out of windows or... Well, I didn't break any windows at Lords, which Matt, <laughs> Matt Pryor did in a test match. Um, but yeah, I certainly, um, you know, a few bats got thrown around in shower rooms and, and, and things like that. And, and I think my teammates would would sort of vacate the dressing room uh, if, if I'd Ramps is on his way back, <laughs> yeah, clear the room. Yeah, and um, which is not good. I didn't, I don't want to be, uh, you know, known for that or associated with that. And certainly now, you know, with my experience when I'm coaching kids, you know, you're, you're trying to help them understand, you know, the, the ups and downs of the game and being able to cope with that. Because as I say, it's so much better for you as a person if you can, if you kind can. of calmly deal with that. I mean, listen, um, you know, I, I've done it. I mean, I mentioned uh, a few podcasts ago where I've lost my temper and my language has been choice. And, um, you know, I, I look back, and, mm. but I think that without the passion, I mean, you, you just yeah. sat there and there was lots of reasons you got to the top of the game mm. because of that ambition, that desire. Did you find that when you had, you, you had, if I go back to a reference, you had your head off, you, that your next games were better or did you did you, that put you into a little slump it's really interesting steve because uh i got into hot water twice in 1992 um and it meant that i didn't get selected for the winter tour for england right so i had a long winter at home thinking about it and 1993 my main uh sort of thing was to stay out of trouble and I had my worst season in county cricket. Really? Yeah. Isn't so, that interesting? So yeah, it's, I think, you know, we, we love football and there's probably footballers who we can think of who, who were always on the edge. And I think I needed to be on the edge a little bit to get the best out of myself, but it's a fine line. Um, I, I mean, as a coach now, I look for players who have a love at a game, who have a passion for it and who are you know, really want to make it work and, and be the best that they can be. Yeah. Um, so I look sometimes for a little bit of fire in the belly um, and I don't mind players being disappointed, um, but th there is a, that point where if they're coming back in and, and you know, they're, they're sort of uh, misbehaving and using bad language and, and uh, it's affecting their teammates, then you have to you know, sort of draw a line there. Uh, uh, do you think that in the world of... Um uh, mental wellness, as I would call it, that we have a better understanding of our sports people. To, I mean, particularly cricket. I mean, I look at cricket and I, I had no ability at all in cricket. I mean, I was a wicket keeper and my nickname was Teflon. Um, <laughs> and I didn't, it came to me and nothing stuck at all. But um, yeah. if, if we look at the world of cricket today, is there a better understanding of the emotional side of cricketers? I mean, you go away on international. I mean, I remember you and I talking at a football match we was at one day where we talked about if you was involved in all aspects of cricket, mm. one day, test match, etc. 
you could you, you were not going to spend much time at home you were going to be away for a long time which mm -hmm. maybe as a young man is okay but uh, do we understand people now at all levels their emotional well-being in, in when they're out of form as we call it in cricket when you're out of nick and their everyday life do we have a better understanding now i think there's much more uh, appreciation of it uh, several high profile cricketers over the years have come out and spoken about their difficulties I think Steve Harmison and, and Marcus Dreskothic spoke about the difficulties of touring and being away in, in hotel rooms uh, in different parts of the world for long periods of time. Um, and of course, uh, the, the supporters, it, it may be tricky to understand that because they see the glamorous side of, you know, well paid, go away, sunny climate and playing cricket. What a great life. And of course, yes, that's all the positives. Um, these individuals have spoken about the uh, expectation, the fact that, you know, performances, if you don't perform, it's very public. People know that you're struggling. Yeah. You can get asked about it in press conferences. Um, so there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. I think um, particularly uh, you mentioned when the, when the players get to a certain age and they may, they may be married or they have young children, again, that's accentuated those pressures um, and, the, and the difficulties and the challenges of touring. Uh, have been highlighted by those guys. Of course, Ben Stokes. I watched the. I watched the. the yeah, um, that that was really fascinating. And I think COVID. Uh, I remember attending some matches as part of the media, uh, some test matches uh, through COVID, and the players, of course, were isolated uh, for quite long periods of time. Uh, although you know, and they were off at say Old Trafford and uh, the ground down at Hampshire, and they were staying on site. Um, and they had to stay in these bubbles, yeah. and that was that was difficult. So I think since then, you know, England have been pretty good actually at rotating players, looking at their schedules individually, particularly those who play all formats. You mentioned Test matches, T20s, 50 overs. Um, those guys who are eligible and, and are good enough to play all formats, they their, their scheduling is looked at perhaps six months in advance, and they may be rested from one or two, um, uh, you, you know, series, but. And, and, and again, I mean, I'm a bit old school in that, you know, well, look, it's an international match. You've got to pick your best side. Yeah, but absolutely. it has become necessary to recognise the challenges of being away for so long. And, and I think that is, is, is one of the things that we touch on on uh, Blighted Talks Bricks is about um, mental wellness. I mean, you, you mentioned the word COVID. I mean, I'm now aware now I, I've tried to rationalise this into the fact that I'm older. But since COVID, I know of more situations and some people that have actually taken their lives. Um, and I just see that now I'm getting people starting to talk to me, to reach out in different formats and in, in, in social media to, to say they're struggling. And I think we now, I mean, you and I, similar sort of age, you've always been bloody better looking, but um, <laughs> similar sort of age when we were growing up, it, it wasn't it wasn't acceptable mm. to, to actually say that you didn't feel great you were having a bad day it certainly wasn't acceptable as a guy mm. to, to to cry yeah uh, but i think across all sorts of sports you know rugby i mean we've just seen it with uh what's going on at saracens with foul um we're seeing that there is a better understanding and i think that's good yeah i think that's good yeah, it's hugely important I mean, my early days at Middlesex, um, as I said, signed in 87. And, uh, you know, if you, you know, sports psycho, well, if you wanted to see a sports psychologist, it was as though you had a problem. You had to go and lie <laughs> down on the sofa. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, so that's how it was treated. It was a very macho culture and you had to get on with the task and show no fallib fallibility, no weakness. So this is completely different now. There are um, people that players can turn to and talk to um, about the challenges they have. And, and of course, um, you know, there is, a, there is that line between, you know, it, there's a brutality to professional sport. Yes. You know, it is them or you, you know. So uh, if you're trying to get into the England team, you know, you're trying to take the place of someone. Um, so you've got that competition within your own team, but also when you go out and play, you play like the boys are going out to India soon, yep. it's gonna be them or you. And, th and there's a brutality to that. So you have to have a certain mentality to cope with that um, but then you look at these outside pressures um, now, which they're, they're, they're much more um, tolerant of and understanding of where, you know, the touring, the staying away from families, they get the families out quite regularly now. Um, and so I think, I think players are, you know, very well supported now and that, you know, but it's an evolving area. 
And do you think, if we go back, if you'd had that kind of support, and I'm going to move on to say it in a moment, where I, I, I knew you before, just before you went into Strictly, uh, and I knew you when you came out of Strictly, and, and I'd, I personally, it's my own personal feeling, I felt that your confidence had grown, just your self-confidence. If you'd had maybe more support and that era back, if we go back in the day, and that would be the same for your opposition as well, that your performance levels would have been higher? It was a different environment when I played for England in the 90s. You know, it was very um, sort of, you, you know, if you played a test match, um, you'd say goodbye to everyone at the end of the game unsure whether you'd be seeing them next week. It was as the brutal next as that, was it? Yeah, the selection. We were, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, probably the most, the biggest thing that's changed is continuity of selection. Yeah. So they've given the players, by playing them, given them a bit more of a run in the side, they've given the players a, um, more confidence to yeah. feel that the emphasis is on England matches and, right, we're preparing for a series, say, against Australia, um, and that's the focus rather than when... I was playing it was more well you play for your county and if you were lucky enough you get picked for the odd test match and um you know but you weren't sure how long that was going to last yeah look i it, again i mean I, in the 90s you had to take your opportunity so i was in and out of the side a lot um because i didn't grasp the opportunity i had i think i had quite a tough initiation and as a result you know my, my confidence was affected and my belief that i could play at that level so it was a real tough thing for me and I, it was only it took me seven years after I made my debut it took me seven years to to reach that milestone of getting 100 for my country which was a hugely proud moment yeah. but I've been through so many ups and downs uh, with that um, but you know finally I, I managed to get there was that your Barbados test yes yes well, it's it quite interesting I was at the gym the other day and there was a friend of mine who follows the Pip Edwards who follows the Barmy Army and I was I mentioned I was seeing you and he said, oh, I was in Barbados, really, 154, was it, 150-something? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and it was, was it seven years in, in yeah. the making? Yeah, that's right. And I've been through so much ups and downs. Um, and as I say, you know, I, I came towards, uh, you know, I'd play for my county where I was secure and happy and under, knew the environment. And I'd get thrown out into that international arena with big crowds, you know, 28,000, 30,000, yeah. uh, you know, the media were all there on the morning of the game. I mean, it was, you know, every Tom, Dick and Harry had, a, had a, an opinion on how you were yeah. playing. Uh, it was a very different feel to it all. And actually, as a kid, I went into it quite naive and didn't really understand it and felt fine. But the longer I didn't make uh, an impact and establish myself... Well, an impact, you did make an impact, but the impact because of your... I mean, you were just one talented cricketer. But I didn't quite manage to establish myself. I think that's that's the thing. Is that, and so, whereas at the county level, I knew that I was in the side, and you could have one or two quiet matches, and that wasn't an issue. I think with the the spotlight uh, on the international side and the fact that they would chop and change the team quite a lot, um, I found that tricky to deal with. Um, now, you know, people like I, I played with Alex Stewart. You know, he would be look. You've got to try and grab your opportunity. Obviously, yeah. um, Alan Knott said to me once. You know, you've got to play every game as though it's your last and give it everything. I struggled with that. Some players... It was a culture that... Well, it was a culture that they knew. It, it was. Um, but, so, you know, someone like a Johnny Bairstow, you know, he will he will actively try and go out and prove people wrong. Yep. Uh, if they're... He if likes them. If he likes them, yeah, doesn't he? If they're giving him criticism. But I, I was a different person there and I, and I wanted to feel that security of, right, you're in, you're backed um, and you've got a few games to play. So... It was a different environment, of course, completely different now. And I think the, the players who get into that England environment are benefiting hugely from the continuity of selection. When when you was playing, um, or maybe even county stuff at Middlesex, was, was there a great team unity with Middlesex in England? Did you? I always look at a team, and we we will see it when we talk about our Arsenal legends. But of of where you're all together, I always, as a as an England cricket fan, yeah. felt that the without media, without cameras, without the knowledge that's out there today, mm. that it was, there was clicks. Mm. That's the way I, I felt as a fan looking at the, the England team. There was, there was the guys that were in and then there was the guys that were on the edge, which I don't get that impression now. 
and and maybe you can tell me now because of your role that you've had in previous years in terms of being a batting coach for Edward. Yeah. Well, look, I'm loving your your shirt there, that retro shirt. I actually was at the 92 World Cup. Um, I did the research that. And it takes me back because, um, you know, we we didn't even have the same colour helmets. We had to buy your own helmet. You were joking. Uh, yeah. So I remember like my debut in 91 when, you know, Graham Hick walked out with a white helmet. Yes. I happened to have a blue helmet because Middlesex were blue, but... Graham Gooch, the captain of England, was wearing a white helmet. So we didn't even have our, you know, sort of, uh, you know, everyone have the same sort of... And the same... Yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. Cap, the, the, putting on the shirt, putting exactly. on the... I mean, yeah. the Australians talk about putting on the bag. I mean, could yeah. you imagine them going yeah. out with a green hat, a blue hat and a yeah. white hat? So we were disjointed, you know, and there wasn't that team feel. And like I say, you know, you could start the first test of the summer, but you might not make the third match of the season. You had to try and take your opportunity, and, and I'm all for that. But equally, um, there were players of of a really good calibre who perhaps needed a little bit longer to settle into the side. Now, that's changed hugely. We had the central contracts come in around about 2000, 2001. What that meant was is that you were contracted to the ECB, so they picked 12 players and you were contracted for the summer. And I remember that that gave them a much better emphasis uh, on looking forward to the challenges of the touring sides that were coming over that summer. Yeah. And there was much more of a feel that the practice and preparation were targeted towards playing against those opposition. So as a group, they came together and there was a much better team feel. That's just grown. Um, and I mean, obviously at the moment, there's been so much said about Ben Stokes as a captain, but one thing he's done is, is he's backed his players in public. Yeah. And they've done everything they can to sort of take the, the pressure off them, so that they can go out and be aggressive and, and play as you as a fan would want them to play. Exactly. You know, they release yeah. the handbrake, they go for it. And sometimes it doesn't come off, but the environment is tolerant of that. And have you, in, again, as a fan watching, been into a few test matches, seeing you guys, when you're your batting coach, I just saw that there was this unity together that people were looking at. Is that, is that the way it is that they were, you guys were all looking out for each other? Yeah, I think, um, you know, that, uh, that, that, that there's, uh, there's always going to be uh, the fact that the, the, it's the pinnacle of your career, you get picked for your country, it's the pinnacle of your career, and there's always that pressure that you're, you're, you're going out and you're, you're trying to do your best. And of course, you're doing your best for the team, but also yourself. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, players come under pressure if, for example, they've had a lean patch. The ambulance you know, gets affected. Yeah, and the, and the media, they get, asked. Yeah, they get talked about the media, they, the questions about their place in the side and speculation on whether they they will be replaced. You know, that is always there. I don't think I, I dealt with that very well. I think that the, the players now, I think are helped and supported much better in terms of their mindset is to think, right, how can I make an impact for the team? Um, and so then they're not thinking about themselves so much. They're more going out to play for their teammates and the team, which is, which is what you're talking yeah, about. There's, exactly. there's much more yeah. of an emphasis on you know, playing for the team, and that kind of takes a lot of pressure off yeah. your individual uh, focus. Have, have you, going back to your batting, um, and it was lovely for me to see you involved in it, are you missing your sort of touring with England as, as the, the batting coach? Do you miss that, or is it, yeah. do you know what, it's, it, I'm ready for a new, different thing, but still want to play at it, you know? And yeah. I still want to be involved in it. Well, I retired in 2012 where I was very lucky. Some doors opened for me and I got asked to do some coaching with England under 17, uh, under 17s. And I, I wasn't sure what to expect. And I, I went along and I loved it. It was really rewarding. You soon realise your career's over. You're an old codger. Uh, and these young blokes in front of me, it was fantastic to go and coach them and, and sort of help support them and encourage them and helpfully guide them a little bit. So I went into coaching. I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a coach, but I went into coaching really enjoyed it worked for the ecb for five and a half years um if you're not playing what's the next best thing working with the best players you've got a front row seat to international cricket i absolutely loved it uh, we traveled around all, i did all the major tours when i came out of it i thought um you know what i've i've had a 25 year career as a player i've done um, some coaching i've done quite a lot of traveling um so i'm actually quite happy with my lot at the moment I've, I've had you know a bit more stability and a bit more home life in recent years and so um people often ask me actually what's the best thing about being a, a professional player and 
and obviously it's the people you meet but it's also the places that i've traveled to yeah, it's been seen. Fa fabulous um i mean all, obviously all cricket related i only went to rome uh, last year for the first time love that but i've done a lot of long haul places yeah. like south africa and australia in the caribbean but um yeah i want to see a little bit more of of mainland europe and the history there but yeah, in terms of the, the the traveling, I'm sort of quite happy with my life at the moment. Good stuff. The uh, question I've got to ask, which, what is it with cricketers and winning Strictly Come Dancing? Well, maybe if, maybe we had a few Saturday night out, uh, <laughs> you know, in the local nightclubs, I don't know. I mean, I saw you go into that and, um, and you owe me some money because I had to pay to vote for you back in those <laughs> days. I think if I had to pay X amount of pence to, to cast my vote, but... Um, you, you just took to it like a duck out of water, is the way it looked. It just, it looked so easy for you. Was it, was it that easy for you? Did it just? No, no it, was, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I mean, I, 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 um, I wasn't really sure, but I said no originally to going on the show because I wasn't sure it for me. And when I agreed to go into the, to go into the show, and I remember telling Mark Butcher, one of my uh, colleagues at Surrey and teammates, um, you know, he just sort of fell down on the floor laughing. And he Did couldn't really? believe it. I didn't know a lot about the show. Right. I must confess, I, I actually rang uh, Darren Goff because um, he'd been on it the previous yeah. year and won it. Yep. You know, and I thought, right, let me ring him for a chat. Anyway, after half an hour of listening to Darren, uh, he was very encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, half an hour? You just had a quick half call, hour, Yeah, you? no, he was great, yeah. Um, but he was really enthusiastic. You know, he said, look, you must do it. You'll have a great time. But of course, he's a very extrovert character. You put well, exactly. You put a spotlight on him, he comes alive. And that's not, I'm not, not no. the same like that, but um, I always say to people that, you know, that the enjoyment I had on the show was down at the, the partner that I was lucky enough to be, be yeah. brought with, Karen Hardy. Who I in fact, actually. Through you, by the way. Yeah, she, um, in fact, our first meeting was not far from here in, in a dance studio in Old Street. Right. And um, I, I remember the, the first meeting, you know, and the BBC cameras are there and rolling and uh, I walked in and I was introduced to Karen Hardy former world champion Latin and ballroom dancer straight away you know um, she was uh, you know I realized I was in the presence of someone who was top of the tree in, in her trade and uh, she took me through a few steps of cha-cha-cha for about the next hour uh, and then um, she got out her mobile phone and she said look Mark can I take your number and I thought yes still got it <laughs> anyway, no, she, and then she said, look, I need to arrange a next training session. So um, she, she put in her phone, Mark, and then she said, look, what's your surname? So I said, well, it's Long. So she wrote, <laughs> she, L -L she wrote Long and then, did she really? Hello. That kind of broke the ice. She had no clue who I was, which was, which was fine. Um, no clue well, nor did you know about her, to but, be well, Exactly. But, you know, we, that kind of broke the ice. And um, she was a really sort of bubbly, warm personality, uh, had knew the show inside out, knew everyone connected with the show. And really, you know, I just went along with her. She, she sort of did all the talking and I was quite happily sort of in the background there, but she, she was great fun. And she, she managed to somehow sort of, you know, for me to shake off feeling very self-conscious. Uh, and, you know, when you, when you go out and do the show, it's almost like getting in character. You know, the, the, the yeah, show's yeah. alive. Yeah. Uh, they were like, the, the, you know, then they were live at the BBC in Shepherd's Bush. And um, that was really nerve wracking, I must say, you know, dressed up in some of that gear. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, yeah. I mean, listen, you look <laughs> great in it. And I think you've got, some, you've got some nicknames from it. So, you know, yeah. it was it. I, I noticed, I mean, obviously, you, you work very hard on that situation. I mean, the people that do it, it's, it's a tough experience. I mean, yeah, it comes across as fun. And, but I noticed a change in you afterwards that, and, and, and a lovely change. I mean, you, as I said at the beginning of this, you, you, you're just one of the finest people I know. And I'm lucky I know a lot of lovely people and you are definitely in that category. But um, you just seem to be more relaxed in life and, and just happier. And it, it, I don't, did you feel that? Did that become, or was it? Yeah, I think it was a great life experience. That's, I mean, I think I've spoken about how focused and tunnel vision I was as a, as a cricketer, you know, from a young age uh, and then, Playing in my 20s, you know, I really wanted to succeed and perhaps that I got the wrong inside of that at times. I, I did Strictly when I was 36. I'd had a, a nice period of, t or a second half of my career at county level playing with Surrey. Um, and I spoke about, you know. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, I had, to, I had two children and, um, you know, that, that balance between being focused but relaxed was a better one. And Strictly certainly helped that. It was an un un 
unbelievable life experience really when I look back at it completely out of my comfort zone um, completely away from cricket I mean you're beamed into people's front room on a Saturday night prime time yeah um, you've got to be able to laugh at yourself no yeah. question about it um, and you've got to go with the flow be adaptable and um, yeah look it was everyone on the show was really nice um, uh, and uh, you know Karen had, had a huge influence on me in terms of her personality and the way she went about things so yeah, I look back at that with really fond memories. And, and once you've done that, um, yeah, it gave me a very different perspective, I think, moving forward. Because do you still put your dancing shoes back on for stuff now? Do you still go back to that? Or is that then that's a sort of a... I'm afraid I don't. I mean, you've reminded me, in 2013, I went along to um, uh, the palace. I was invited to, to, to go along and receive an honour, an, yeah. an, an MBE. Yeah. Uh, 2013, I went along amazing, to the palace. Amazing thing to be recognised. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, 25 years as a player, and I you was know, hugely proud. Went along to the Palace big day, you know, and you know, all these other people there, you know, getting these honours. And eventually my turn came, and I went up and I knelt before the Queen. And she, well, it was the Queen that gave it to you as well. Queen, wow. You know, and she, she um, was pinned, just as she was pinning the, the MBE on my, on my blazer there, she said, Are you still dancing? Did she really? And uh, yeah, I said, Of course, that. It was amazing. I said that my hips don't move like they used to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did she just take? Off? She had a little chuckle with that. Really? Yeah. So that was that was a really memorable moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, what a wonderful achievement. And and I've got a little bone to pick with you because you left my team, Middlesex, to yes. go to the dark side. Yes. People say to me in, in cricket, "What's the dark side?" Well, it could be Kent, it could be Essex, it could be Surrey, as a, where, where you went. Yeah. And I kindly came to see you. But I left because I had the hump. Uh, because you played against my beloved Middlesex and scored 250 something. Um, yeah. I think your average for those two seasons uh, in County Cricket, I don't think you might be the only person that have done this. I'm sure somebody will come to us and tell us otherwise. But I think you averaged over 100 for the Surrey two seasons. I, I mean, for people that play cricket. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just wonder whether that Strictly Come Dancing, but you kindly got me the tickets to go to game. We were going to meet up, and I actually sent you a text message, said, you can sod off, I'm not coming out with you. You've just actually put my team to the start. Not one day, but not just one, just yeah. double. Um, but it was it was lovely to watch you in your cricket. And, it, and I have another funny story about you, is um, we were talking one day, and you said you just got really into golf. And I've watched your golf over the last few years. And, and I don't know what it is with professional sportsmen, Mark, but whether they're, the, the, the jockeys are the worst. Don't go anywhere near a jockey if you've got money in your wallet playing golf. They'll take it away from you. But I've never played golf with a professional sportsman that is so um, competitive when we, when we play golf. I mean, they become evil. And, and I've played with you. We've, we've got beat a couple of times by yeah. some other celebrities. Yeah. I remember uh, Mr. Ferdinand and Mr. Sherwood giving us a humping round woven, yeah. but I played with you a time, and your competitive edge in golf comes through. I mean, especially in the beginning, I could see you getting so frustrated, and golf is a frustrating game. Yeah, I think I must be just getting to that age, and I've, I've taken up golf. It's kind of replaced uh, cricket, actually. Um, you know, that love of batting and that pursuit of mastery, you know, at something, and I, that was my focus for so long. And then as I've uh, actually took up golf when I became a coach, well, I was hanging around with some other coaches and when we were touring to all these lovely places. Got great golf Once we did, yeah, we finished training and we'd go off and, you know, they'd ring up and say, well, the England team are, uh, are coming along and they'd go, yeah, you're yeah, coming along. And the coaches would tag along at, at the end. And so um, I got to learn a bit more about the game and appreciate it a bit more. I never really understood it as a, yeah. when I was playing cricket. So um, I've... I've it, it, that's been my focus now, and and I've I've loved the the battle really of trying it's, to be a bit it's more a battle. Yeah, trying to be a bit more consistent, understanding all the facets of the game. I watch it on the TV. I actually went to the Open, which was such a a big thrill last year. I I've never been to a professional tournament, right. so uh, I went to the Open at Royal Liverpool. Wonderful to see all these world class players at the top of their game. And, uh, so yeah, that's a new love for me. And it, but it's a it's a very social thing. It's a good, it's um, a great it's a great social environment. It it does love it, and it's been lovely for me to come on a little bit of your golfing journey to play with you. As yeah. every time you come back, I think, oh, your swing looks a bit better. Is <laughs> even at all? <laughs> oh yeah, and I and I just know that you're you're naturally you're just a naturally talented sportsman, but you've got to put the effort in, and and that's clearly what you. I do. like I like to do that. I like to you know, 
put put if you put a bit of effort in hopefully you get the reward i like i say better understanding the game and i mentioned about the social thing i mean look i i got invited by jimmy tarbuck yeah uh, when he was on we did the strictly thing in 2006 right, okay. and he then invited me to a charity golf day and i'm involved with still with the charity it's called the variety golf which i'm a, a member of as well yeah and they place they have some wonderful days um you, you're the best part of the day we we have play some wonderful golf courses and we have some lovely lunches but the best part of the day is they raise money for disadvantaged kids um and for schools that that need support and they they raise money and get these mini buses yep. that allows the kids to move around and have trips you know maybe off to the seaside or off to a local leisure center or wherever and sometimes the kids turn up and the, the delight and the look in their eye when they see they've got this new bus that's going to change their life fabulous so um, I'm really, de you know, delighted to be still involved with the variety. I was captain, uh, I think, in 2017. They have a lot of ex-sports people involved. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm a member of the, the same society. Jamie yeah. Little does an amazing job. He does, yeah. Uh, and that should be certainly sort of marked yeah. up. Um, but again, it's I always love this about the celebrities in all sports, um, dance, music, They for the variety club. They, they give so much time and effort, as you do. I know you're a an amazing person for giving up your time because I'm I go to a number of events and you're, you're there and and again it's something it's an unfair rap that British sports stars get yeah um, they never get the kudos and the credit that they give up their time which they're they're all busy doing things they give up their time they also lots of them give different ways to charities and I know that you're a, a big supporter of lots of charities and uh, I know that you know you get a lot of respect from that there are people, but it, it's lovely. There's a lovely camaraderie. I think you know. I think cricketers and rugby players have always been more. They've been more accessible than the top footballers, yeah. purely because the money, really, the commercial yeah. thing. But I think footballers and rugby players have been very aware of, you know, playing in sponsors' days and golf days and things like that. Um, but what I must say about football, though, that the variety is very well supported by football. Uh, Sir Trevor Brooking. Yeah. Uh, goes it's I think we've got well I think Dave Dave, Dave Besson's captain this, this year captain, yeah so yeah Steve Koppel is there uh, I mean so there are there are lots of ex-footballers who support the variety charity and and as I say you go along you, you're playing these wonderful golf courses you play with three people that you've not probably not met before oh. but yeah you know have a have a nice walk around nice laugh make conversation and then you see that the end of it that you know when the buses are presented and the kids come just um, levels it out does it yeah, yeah. and and talking about leveling out, just before we wrap up, just um, you and I are both big uh, Arsenal fans, big Gooners. Um, have you got any opinion on the um, Mr. Arteta's goalkeeping um, shenanigans, as I would call it? Yeah. Well, What's look, your view on that? Well, look, um, I, th he's, I think he's done a wonderful job and is doing a wonderful job. He's galvanised the club in so many different ways. Um, and the culture of the club seems different now and everyone's you know seems very upbeat and they've got a good direction and they're all pulling together which wasn't the case necessarily very before. True. things have got a bit stale perhaps so he's got a lot of things right um i thought the signing of declan rice has been unbelievable what what he seems cheap he is now, he's a, what a leader he is he's been fabulous arteta has galvanized the club mm. you're right he's pulled it all together i'm not sure that his statements helped with that when he was talking about he fancies substituting a goalkeeper and that really brings me back to uh, when I started this conversation to say that every time, and I, and I mean this 100%, every time I'm in your company, you always leave me in a happier place. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And I appreciate you're busy. It's been a pleasure for me uh, to just sit here and chat a few things over. I could sit and talk to you all day long. Um, I look forward to seeing you on the links soon. You're going to be my partner because I'm definitely not playing against you. Um, but Mark Rampkash, MBE, the most talented cricketer I have personally seen play a number of times. You represented England with a uh, passion and a love. You're an, an, a legend at Middlesex, and I'm sure they still think very highly of you at Surrey. But Mark, pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on uh, Safe Travels. Um, to all the listeners of, uh, um, and watchers of uh, Blighty Talks Bricks, no, none of you are having this. I'm keeping this. This is mine. Mark, thanks very much. Thanks so much, Steve. Really enjoyed it.